Hello and welcome to the fourth day of the inauguration conference of the Korea Europe Center at the Institute of Korean Studies at Freie Universität Berlin. My name is Gabriel Tain Lux. I am, I am a fellow researcher here at the Institute of Korean Studies and I will be your host for today. Today's panel is all about conflict and peace on the Korean Peninsula. Let me introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Kim Dung Jin from Trinity College of Dublin, who will talk about peace building and Korean civil society. Dr. Kim Dong Jin is an Irish School of Ecumenics Fellow in Peace and Reconciliation Studies. Dr. Kim obtained his PhD from the University of North Korean Studies in Korea, a Master of Letters in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of Sydney, and a Master of Divinity in Theology from Hanshin University in Korea. He serves as a Goodwill Ambassador for Peace on the Korean Peninsula, appointed by the Ministry of Unification of South Korea, and has also been working as a policy advisor for the Korean peacebuilding NGOs, including the Korean Sharing Movement and Okge Dongmu Children in Korea. His main areas of expertise cover peace building, comparative research on peace process, North Korea, East Asia, civil society, humanitarian aid and development, and ecumenical movement. Now, before we start the lecture by Dr. Kim Dong Jin, let me uh, give a brief technical announcement. This lecture will be recorded and uploaded on the homepage and YouTube channel later. After the presentation, we have a Q&A session. If you have any questions, then feel free to use the chat feature and send questions to the host. Uh, in this case, to me, please. So, Dr. Kim Dong Jin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Jin Kim. Um, and Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk about peace building and Korean civil society at this very important event. So, um, the term peace process uh, refers to a um, process of building peace through staged negotiations before and after an armistice peace agreement. And these days we talk about Korean peace process a lot. Uh, but then it has uh, various uh, processes um, and through stages negotiations and, and there could be a pre-negotiations uh, stage and, and management stage and we would have peace treaty or accord and peace accord uh, uh, when it's made and we could have uh, the post-accord reconstruction. Uh, but then in terms of the practice of uh, the peace process, that there is a term um, called peace building. And then the peace building uh, refers to comprehensive mixture of activities in peace process, uh, focusing on uh, the conditions uh, under which a peace process is sustainable uh, as, um, um, as uh, reported by the former uh, UN Secretary General Bruce Bruce Bali, uh, the peacemaking and peacekeeping are required to hold conflict and preserve peace once it's obtained. But if successful, they strengthen the opportunity for post-conflict peace building, which can prevent the recurrence of violence uh, among nations and peoples. Um, and as we know that there have been a series of agreements in the Korean peace process. Uh, and however, unfortunately, uh, none of these uh, agreements were never fully implemented. Um, so in order to uh, increase the sustainability of peace process, and, and many strategic peace building researchers highlight that uh, signed papers uh, would not uh, make a difference, and the agreement collapsed unless the processes of genuine genuine engagement are created. So this, a sustainable uh, peace building strategy uh, would require genuine spaces of 
uh, accessible public engagement and coordination of multiple activities and multiple roles at multiple levels, including the work of civil society. Uh, and the civil society has been regarded by uh, many peace and conflict scholars as an intermediary between adversaries and also between the elite and grassroots to make uh, breakthroughs in peace processes and to guarantee a sustainability of uh, peace building. Uh, and a peace and uh, conflict studies researcher, uh, uh, Ryan, who say that, that whereas peacekeeping is about building barriers uh, between uh, the warriors, and peace building tries to build bridges between uh, the ordinary people. And another uh, peace and conflict studies uh, scholar, John Paul Lederach, will say that uh, how it's, it's important uh, to, to note that sustainable peace building depends on how many of our compatriots within the public sphere have moved towards the awareness of what we believe in and how many are willing to act on it. So again, the, the signed papers are important and peace agreements are important. But then uh, the actually the sustainable peace building would depend on how many uh, of the people in the society would uh, share the belief in, from the peace agreement and how many are willing to uh, act on it is, is the key. But then the case study on uh, Korean civil society peace building has not been drawing substantial attention uh, in peace and conflict studies scholarship, uh, given its uh, extensive uh, geopolitical dimensions involving the Cold War legacy and nuclear weapons. And so um, the Korean case has been explored and investigated uh, from the perspective of international relations uh, quite a lot, but then it, it hasn't been drawing attention uh, from the peace studies. Um, however, uh, there have been uh, several South Korean civil society groups who built relationships with uh, people in North Korea across the demilitarized zone and promoted uh, civic values for peace in South Korean society in order to overcome the fragile armistice situation and to, to build a sustainable peace on the Korean peninsula. Uh, so exploring uh, the role of the Korean civil society is expected to narrow the gaps in the Korean peace process, both in terms of knowledge and practice. And I would say that it adds significant empirical substance to the discussions in uh, peace studies surrounding the potential of peace study, uh, sorry, civil society for sustainable peace building uh, on the Korean peninsula in particular. Um, having said that, uh, I would like to start uh, with an example of religious civil society. Uh, and most South Korean churches, the Christian churches, adopted a strong anti-communist position after the division of the Korean Peninsula. And then there were many Christians in South Korea who fled uh, from North Korea to avoid the oppression. Uh, the anti-communist uh, character had been strengthened by going through the Korean War. Uh, however, a group of uh, North Korean Christians and South Korean Christians were able to meet with each other at a seminar organized by the World Council of Churches in 1986 in Switzerland. And it was the first non-governmental level meeting between North and South Korea. So since the uh, armistice of the Korean War, of course. And the South Korean church leaders came back to Korea and, and they announced the declaration of the Churches of Korea on National Unification and Peace, uh, so-called 88 Declaration in 1988, saying the people of North and South are not only ignorant of the life and culture of their fellow Koreans, but have been trained to believe they must not know about one another. And both systems are teaching their people to see their blood brothers and sisters as their most feared enemy. So they wanted to bring an awareness of the fact that 
it doesn't have to be like that. The, the people could meet with each other and then they can build relationships. Uh, and there were many uh, such meetings followed after the uh, the meeting between the religious leaders and women's meetings in particular. And uh, in the 1990s, groups of South and North Korean women were able to meet at and build relationships uh, across the demilitarized zone. Uh, as you know, the DMZ is the border between North and South Korea. Uh, so they, they did it through several meetings on the issues of unification, the threat of war and nuclear weapons, and the legacy of Japanese colonialism and comfort women, and as well as gender equality uh, issues in their uh, societies. The South Korean women peace activists uh, highlight the need for involvement of women in peace building. For example, uh, as I sh shared on the screen, in the situation of uh, the Korean division, even if women work hard, it's difficult to deconstruct the priority status of men. Uh, when there is high defense spending, uh, women's welfare is ignored. Therefore, women began to highlight the need for arms reduction, to initiate anti-war movements, and to monitor the, the import of military uh, weapons. The Korean division strengthened uh, militarism and patriarchy, and it maintains the military and patriarchal culture in society. Therefore, women came to the conclusion that they should resist not only patriarchy, but also militarism and its culture. And in the meantime, North Korea endured several massive uh, natural disasters, as many of you know including a series of floods uh, in, in the mid-1990s. Uh, and, and these disasters uh, battered an already weakened economy, resulting in a sharp decline in food availability. And the public distribution system uh, uh, almost totally uh, collapsed. So the, the, the South Korean uh, civil society uh, wanted to uh, provide aid to North Korea at that time, but it ha it carried undeniable uh, security connotations from the beginning, uh, as you can imagine. And the South Korean government back in the 90s severely restricted all aid to North Korea, uh, claiming that this was a national security issue. And, and as a response to this, South Korean civil society groups initiated a nationwide campaign uh, to transform the public image of North Koreans from the enemy to brothers and sisters in need. Um, but then the South Korean NGO aid to North Korea significantly increased after the introduction of the Sunshine Policy, uh, as many of you know by the South Korean government in the late 1990s. Uh, in the beginning, North Korea expressed strong antipathy to the Sunshine Policy, calling it a vicious, cunning policy to disarm them. Uh, but progress in the high-level peace process eventually uh, led to uh, expanded civilian-level exchanges, uh, including family reunions, social and cultural exchanges, and aid activities by South Korean NGOs in, in North Korea. And as the amount of uh, private aid grew, uh, the number of NGOs increased uh, considerably. As you can see, that uh, by 2007, um, almost uh, 80 NGOs had direct contact uh, in North Korea. And more and more South Korean NGOs launched uh, a humanitarian project in different sectors of North Korea, such as food security, and emergency relief, health, uh, medical, um, and agriculture, livestock, environment, and, and some capacity building programs as well. And noticeably, uh, the interaction uh, between South Korea and North Korea through aid projects by South Korean NGOs uh, built personal relationships uh, between North and South Koreans, as you can see uh, from the photo uh, that it does, it's provided by the Okidomo children in Korea, one of the NGOs in, in, 
in South Korea. And as you can see from the photos, and um, they all worked together, the South Korean NGO staff, and you see the North Korean party official uh, beside uh, the NGO staff, and South Korean technician is there. And then the North Korean technician is uh, there working with them. And then you get you see the North Korean workers behind the scene. So they all worked together. Uh, and not only this uh, construction project, uh, but also there were uh, various different types of agriculture project. And these uh, photos are from uh, the Korean sharing movement. And, and it's a joint, it was a joint project uh, between the local government from Korea called Gyeonggi Province and uh, the South Korean NGO uh, Korean Sharing Movement. They um, um, modernized and renovated the corporate uh, uh, farm in North Korea. And as you can see from the photos, and there's a polytunnel and then milling factories and, and then joint harvest and, and all that. And then they all worked together um, in the mid uh, 2000s. And regarding uh, the relationship building um, between North and South Korea, uh, from the experience of this humanitarian and development project, uh, one of the NGO workers would say that if we help people who are in need without uh, hurting uh, their self-esteem, they get to feel that we all share humanity and care about each other. And I witnessed their hearts changing. Uh, what is peace or even unification anyway? Uh, if we could reduce hatred against each other, that is peace. The purpose of humanitarian aid is to help people live like human beings in peace. So the, 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 this, this types of trust building between North and South Korean NGOs uh, through humanitarian and development aid uh, nurtured several other engagement projects. For example, I'd like to show you a, a, a short um, video clip captures, uh, again provided by a South Korean NGO um, of getting with children who promoted the meeting between young people while conducting humanitarian cooperation. Um, so this, the name of this NGO is called Okkedongmu, and then as many of you would know that Okkedongmu would mean uh, that the friends who uh, can uh, put their arms around each other. Uh, and it, it had the double meanings when this NGO was created in the mid 90s. And because of the humanitarian uh, situation in North Korea, uh, they got to learn uh, that many children are stunted because of malnutrition. Their eye levels would be different from the eye levels of the South Korean children. So in order to put their arms around and, and then and to be able to reduce the difference, not only in terms of our systems or our mindset or our society or experience, but also in terms of height differences. So they they wanted to address the issue of the malnutrition uh, by providing nutritional aid and um, building hospitals in North Korea. But at the same time, they promoted uh, the relationship building between uh, young people. And it was very challenging and difficult but again, uh, as time went by, the trust were built and according to the children, and then finally uh, they were able to uh, uh, have their project on the uh, promoting meeting between uh, children uh, from North Korea and uh, from South Korea. This, these photos are uh, uh, taken in, inside of North Korea, and I captured one of uh, their um, promotion films. And as you can see, that the North Korean and South Korean children uh, were talking uh, together. And shall we put our arms around each other's so shoulders? And then um, I hope we could beat each other someday. And, and one of the South Korean children would say that we have different accents and backgrounds, but we immediately became friends as we opened up uh, to one another. And then they asked question, can we look forward to our promise to meet and play again with 
our arms around one another's shoulders. Uh, so it happened uh, in, in, in the mid 2000s and until 2008. Uh, but as many of you know, this uh, since uh, late 2000s, uh, due to North Korean development of nuclear and missile technology and changes of the US and South Korean government's policy to North Korea, the tension at the government level significantly uh, increased and this tension began to neg negatively affect uh, the humanitarian aid to North Korea by the South Korean NGOs. And eventually, um, again, as many of you know, in 2010, uh, most of the humanitarian and peace building work, um, not only by the government, but by the NGOs uh, were put uh, to a stop and, and suspended uh, by May 24 measures. And meanwhile, uh, this positive engagement policy towards North Korea caused a serious uh, debate within South Korean and international societies. And those who support peace building with North Korea argue that engaging with the North is the best way to deter further development of nuclear weapons or possibly make the North to give up nuclear weapons. For them, peace building with North Korea will ensure uh, security by improving the relationship uh, with, with North Korea and aid cooperation and peace building and promotion of people's exchange will eventually guide North Korea towards self-reform and, and improve North Korean human rights as well. And they argued a non-engagement and criticism and oppression and will only make the regime toughen uh, their own political oppression inside of uh, the North Korean society. And however, those who oppose engaging with North Korea maintain that it will undermine national security by giving the failing North Korea the opportunity to survive and to develop more advanced uh, nuclear weapons and missile technology. And in their view, the best way to build peace is not to improve the inter-Korean relationship by negotiating or you know, building peace with North Korea, but to walk away from North Korea waiting for regime collapse. And they say North Korean regime will never reform itself and any humanitarian aid or development cooperation or people's exchange will only feed uh, the corrupted authoritarian regime. Therefore, they argue uh, that the South Korean government and international community should use sanctions, tough sanctions like sticks for the sake of international security and North Korean human rights instead of providing aid uh, like carrots. Uh, and likewise, any debate around North Korea, since it cannot be separated, separated from other issues surrounding the Korean conflict. And that the context of the Korean conflict and division and the different levels of response are what makes uh, peace building all the more complicated. And it seems as though this complexity has been lost in the simple yes and no debate based on uh, assumed positivity or assumed negativity. But rarely is the question asked on both sides is the how question and how to contribute to security, better inter-Korean relations, good governance of North Korea and improving North Korean human rights instead of making all these words. So uh, in terms of the people who have different opinions and dip different policy preference, um, they don't get to talk to each other more often. And then they, they just have uh, this idea that this, uh, their preference, uh, their preferred policy will work in terms of North Korea based on the assumption. But then unfortunately, it only fluctuated between uh, the two positions instead of uh, tr uh, finding or exploring the, um, the answer to the how question. And there has been criticism of uh, the current high level peace process in that it lacks a comprehensive and detailed uh, strategy uh, 
and and it appears that the current strategy by the major parties uh, requires a change of action from North Korea first, and particularly denuclearization first, and the other agendas such as humanitarian situation in North Korea could be more seriously addressed um, after the North Korean nuclear issues is resolved. But how could we move beyond uh, this impasse? And, and but this challenge is not unique uh, to the Korean case. And increasingly, local peace actors uh, began to engage with one another in different contexts. For example, not to produce a panacea for every peace process, but to identify parallels and differences uh, in the challenges and opportunities of each process, which can serve as useful lessons and provide new imagination uh, for each situation. And for example, uh, as was introduced, I am currently based on the island of Ireland. And for the past five years, I have witnessed uh, a, a reciprocal empowerment features from people's interaction between uh, Korea and Ireland, the Korean and the Irish and Northern Irish peace processes, civil society in particular, that they want to learn from each other and was inspired by each other and in interestingly shared their own frustration as well. And it's in a way um, a self-reflection uh, about their own peace building experience and activities and also healing experience uh, about their frustration and also um, experience of solidarity uh, to support uh, each other. And this concept of reciprocal empowerment uh, has been uh, primarily utilized by uh, feminist scholars on women's empowerment. Uh, and a scholar uh, like uh, Darlington and Mulvaney define uh, reciprocal empowerment as a discursive style of interaction grounded in reciprocity which provides people with a level of uh, knowledge necessary to develop a heightened self-confidence that can then uh, lead to action and create an egalitarian environment that fosters uh, mutual respect, mutual attention, mutual empathy, mutual engagement, and mutual responsiveness. And just, just briefly, uh, why uh, the Korean interest in Ireland all of a sudden? And as many of you know, that there have been huge interest from Korea uh, in, in the unification experience of Germany. Uh, but lately, uh, there were uh, the interest uh, uh, growing from Korea about the Irish peace process. And uh, one of the reasons would be the historical similarities in terms of colonialism, and division and war. Uh, but then uh, the need for peace agreement appears to be uh, more attractive and comparable and um, because it is still an ongoing process in terms of the Irish peace process. And then there are wealth of peace building research and practice uh, in, in Ireland and, and the European experience combined. Um, but the, the difference would be that since the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement in 1998 and the border between North and South of Ireland is open, uh, even though there are still challenges in the peace process, but this is the most uh, um, stark difference between Korea and Ireland. And then the people from uh, Korea visiting this open border and then they, they are charged a bit full of jealousy uh, about the situation in Ireland. Uh, but uh, there are still challenges, as I mentioned, in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland in particular, um, especially due to Brexit. And as you can see from the photos uh, underneath of the open border photo, the society is still divided. Uh, but However, uh, despite all that, uh, the South Korean peace NGO, uh, for example, uh, a peace education manager who visited uh, Ireland uh, a number of times, uh, uh, says that what was inspiring from getting out of one's context and looking at uh, oneself in a mirror from other peace process is that uh, uh, one would say that South Korea has learned 
to live with itself and develop more open identity since the democratization. But still in South Korea, you cannot say we have this positive idea about North Korea. And I, I think in Ireland, they found a, a space where they can engage with each other. Massive lessons for the Korean authority. That actually, I know the state want to control and state would not uh, trust the people to take it over. But unless the state uh, let them create, let the society and people create the space, then how are gonna they, uh, how they are ever going to move past uh, that identity barricade and create a new shared learning to live with each other. So unless you go down that road, then even if you say you are advocating peace, you are actually just waiting for the merger or merger, excuse me, of one or the other. Uh, but then a, a founder of a North Northern Irish peace NGO um, who visited both North and South Korea, excuse me, says, uh, you find your own solution. But then in, in the process, I think it's, it's about building in the world today, a solidarity movement. We take encouragement from when we go to see the movement in South Korea and North Korea. So that is why we went just to be in solidarity. I think that is what it was and we want to continue with that kind of solidarity. Uh, this is partly because they, the Irish peace builders also recognize uh, their own challenges and issues and particularly when they are in Korea and they get to see their own challenges in a mirror. So in terms of the lesson sharings between the different peace processes and between, for example, Korea and Europe, it's not like we are transferring uh, already built knowledge from this region and the other region. And it's the learners uh, who's from, from the perspective of the people who want to learn something other and who want to have the, um, some new imagination, they create their own knowledge out of their own interest with their own personal authority, but using the, uh, the different mirror from the other context. Um, and another uh, civil society uh, leader from Northern Ireland uh, was a, a executive director of the Northern Irish uh, Reconciliation NGO visited Korea who say that it is not uh, the big USA coming to fix uh, everything or something. I think it, it is uh, easier for a country like Korea and Ireland. We do not threaten each other. We do not start with a culture bias. We start with deep cultural difference, but that is okay. We can find welcome. It is just softer, easier, without having to get out of the way of the culture in parallelist, top down, top up, bottom up, or whatever, whatever way it works. You're not a threat, and that way, culturally, the work has to stay valid and relevant and useful and practical in terms of engagement. So the Korean civil society who promoted uh, peace building with North Korea hugely frustrated because of the suspension of their work in 2010, and then it's not uh, re resuming yet. And then we, we've got 10 years of uh, the history of uh, frustration from the South Korean civil society. And then um, they get to see uh, the other situation. And then to say that in, in terms of the Irish experience, uh, and then it's important to ensure a lesson about why and how we deliberate and promote and secure these common civic values for peace building no matter what, even though it's very challenging. And this is especially significant for civil society as states would perceive and understand societies from the perspective of national interest, while civil society groups are value-oriented and interested in people's lives. And these interactions between uh, Korean and Irish peace builders uh, created a collaborative uh, peace education programs such as uh, Generation for Peace. Uh, this is a project between the Akira Children, uh, the, the NGO I mentioned, 
and our city Belfast, uh, up in Belfast. Uh, the Our City Belfast uh, is an NGO uh, promoting uh, the shared education between the different communities and different conflict parties, particularly the new generations. And this is one of the scenes um, captured by PD's notebook uh, by uh, a South Korean uh, national television called NBC. And then the facilitator asked the question, what would divide our society? And then the young people who say that it would be uh, old generations and they recall how they were being uh, taught that the uh, other people in the other uh, conflict parties um, would look different. And now that we, grew, we are growing up together, um, perhaps the, our Irish future and would be a Northern Irish future would be different. But then uh, they are very lucky because they they have our city Belfast and then this piece of education NGOs in Northern Ireland. But a majority of uh, young people still go to uh, the separated school, and then they are still exposed to the narrative of hatred and animosity against each other. And then people say that the danger here is that the old generation who experienced the troubles. Who, who know how uh, it's really terrible um, the war was, and then they don't want to go back to the situation of war, uh, even though they still have this enmity and animosity against each other. They don't want to go back to the situation of war. And yet the young generations who never experienced the war, and then they are exposed to the narrative of hatred. And there is the danger because they, get to act on it because they don't know how horrible it was. And then they are just, you know, lear learning how to hate with, with each other. So there are challenges in, in Northern Ireland and it's, it's quite similar in terms of the situation in many conflict affected societies in, in Korea as well. Um, so young people from uh, Korea and Northern Ireland meet uh, via Zoom every month. Uh, to share their lives, uh, conflict and peace process. And they, they discuss various issues about their own society uh, affected by uh, the protracted conflict. And then one of the interesting things uh, coming out of this is that I, I noticed that they were able to discuss the questions which it would otherwise be difficult to ask in their own context. Because as you know, that when you are living in the conflict affected society, there are things you can say and you cannot say. But when these group of people who share some of the experience of living in conflict affected society and how it could be sensitive to talk about such issues in, in the, in the settings where you have this identity politics. And then you get to uh, you ask and think uh, together about these issues from the lens and the mirror of the other uh, people's experience. And I would like to conclude um, my talk today uh, with uh, the Korean preface of Building Peace, uh, which is a, a, a book of a textbook of peace building uh, done by John Paul Lederach, written by John Paul Lederach, and I translated it um, several years ago, and uh, John Paul Ledra kindly provided uh, the Korean uh, edition preface. And then I'll just conclude uh, with his words. Uh, the challenge of digging deep into protracted conflict does not sit primarily with the complexity of issues, the long history of conflict, or the callous hardness of leadership. It requires a belief that ch change is possible at its sense, it requires that we face a paradox. On the one hand, we must be very clear and realistic with the difficult underground facts that generates the conflict, division, and intractability. On the other, we must never forget that we as a human community are capable of the creative act, capable of giving birth to something that does not now exist. But if I had one hope, and this is also my hope, uh, well, and in some small way that the words uh, of sharing the experience will contribute to keeping hope alive, to sparking an idea or two, even a single person saying something can be done, 
and the inevitable. I, I do believe that it's an inevitable process. And the inevitable process of seeking a way forward beyond the conflict begins to emerge and solidify. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, lecture. I learned a lot. I would like to ask you one question. We all know and we all are a little bit worried about the decreasing interests in unification and in general in North Korea and South Korean society, especially the uh, younger generation. And despite of the work you uh, presented us, uh, what the NGOs are doing with North Korea or for North Korea or for the Korea, for Korea in, in, as a whole, um, how do these NGOs in South Korea address um, this kind of internal problem when with the decreasing interest? Because then somehow in the future the basis will go away. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very important and then very um, uh, good question. Um, and perhaps I could answer the question um, from the perspective of uh, the Irish society, even though I'm not Irish, the experience from, from my end here is that, you know, it's, it's not unique. Uh, to the Korean situation, that young generation would have less interest in the situation uh, of conflict and peace and, and in terms of the issue of unification uh, in Korea. And because they have their own issues uh, facing in front of them. And then um, I would say that um, in terms of the issue of unification, and the key here is that how to make it relevant in the new generation's life. How, how to, to make them see that it's not just about uh, your education of uh, national identity, or it's not just about the old generations, which is it's directly relevant and related to your own life. And then how uh, our society can be different if we achieve unification, for example. And then if we want to achieve unification, what kind of unification would be the dream of our, um, our new generations? And then um, how peaceful the uh, society can be uh, both for both North and South Korea. So it's not just about the issue for North Korea, it's also uh, about the issue for South Korea as well. And a more open discussion should be possible in terms of um, the issue of unification, for example. Um, it's just sometimes because that um, many uh, young generations would feel that they're being taught uh, to uh, say yes for the unification. They're being um, asked to say yes uh, to, the, to the unification instead of being asked how would you think that the unification would happen? And what types of unification would you want? And what would be the best for the Korean future and in terms of peace building? And, and so I think that so more open society, and yes, the Korean society is open and then it's vibrant democracy, but then still you get to see and experience the experience of uh, the conflict and, and this conflict-affected society features are still limiting uh, the free discussion about this sort of issue. So um, I hope that that answered you. We have another, thank you very much for your answer. We have another question um, from Martin Gielmann. He says, thank you for your talk. What role do you think associations of Koreans in Japan, like Mindan and uh, Chungnyeon, can play for the Korean peace process? Uh, thank you very much for for very interesting question. And and then I would say that the diaspora communities uh, uh, can definitely uh, contribute 
to the issue of peace building and peace process, particularly uh, the Korean diaspora groups that, like you just mentioned, then um, who were the overseas Koreans prior to the division of the Korean Peninsula, they might have some different understanding about the situation uh, of the Korean conflict. And then they might have some different perspectives on a, the issue of how to build relationship between North and South Korea. And then sometimes they can be the intermediary. For example, like when um, this South Korean NGO, Get on the Children, uh, uh, I mentioned, um, were promoting the exchange between children in North Korea and South Korea. And they had this I the idea that perhaps you know, if it's difficult to meet face to face, and um, they could uh, create an artwork, and then uh, exchange those artwork and letters uh, with each other. And then, as far as I know, then overseas Koreans in in Japan uh, became the intermediaries, and then they also participated uh, in that circulation of the artwork. And it goes on until now that they have this uh, exhibition every year that uh, children's artwork, for example, from South Korea and from Japan and from China and from North Korea and would be collected and then it would rotate, for example, like exhibition in Seoul, exhibition in Tokyo, exhibition in Pyongyang, exhibition in Beijing. It would rotate and then they get to see how we share the same uh, humanity and then be, uh, what would it means uh, to be a Korean um, living in a different society and, and as such how uh, we are actually limiting these interactions and encounter between these young people and new generations. And, and it's, it's a very moving and uh, sort of uh, initiatives. And, and again, that the, um, the role of the overseas Korean and diaspora community would be very, very important. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we are getting a lot of questions and I apologize uh, to everyone whose question uh, we won't be able to answer today, and which I select. Um, the next question is from Dr. Cho so Young, and she says and asks, human rights problems are a tricky issue when it concerns North Korea. On the one hand, it is a politicized issue and used as a partisan instrument. On the other hand, the problems indeed exist there to a considerable degree. In the peace building processes and engagement with the North, do you think what role human rights concerns should play? In your opinion, should the civil society in South Korea more actively vocalize and be engaged in the human rights issues in North Korea? Or should they take the position of peace building first and let them solve their internal problems by themselves? In addition, what do you think about arguments uh, on international aid condition uh, on human rights improvement? Uh, again, the very important question. And I do believe that human rights should be an important element of peace building with North Korea. But uh, the, the questions from um, uh, the, uh, Dr. Joe uh, um, already answered uh, uh, some of my uh, um, answer uh, that, you know, actually um, in terms of human rights, um, um, many uh, human rights activists and then um, the scholars would say that the best uh, strategy would be to have uh, and you know help people to have ownership in terms of pro promoting human rights in their own society and then how to facilitate the state would, would sort of uh, change its position in terms of uh, promoting human rights all the more and then that's uh, really sometimes very difficult uh, to be done by the external intervention. And sometimes the humanitarian intervention would cause um, more serious problems uh, like war and conflict in the region. 
So I understand the sensitivity of human rights, uh, but then it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to put aside the issue of human rights when we are building peace with North Korea or when we are providing human, uh, humanitarian aid to North Korea, because it's not only North Korea, but also South Korea has uh, oftentimes and you know, in the past more often that has hum human rights issues and also the Western countries it also has human rights issues, so it should always be monitored and highlighted from the perspective of the international community. So in a sense that I think that the efforts to highlight the human rights situation about North Korea should continue. But then the work uh, of the, for example, peace building NGOs who try to build a, a sort of relationship with North Korea um, would focus on their own work and their own uh, mandate and of course being aware of the situation uh, of North Korea but then by doing their work um, and as I, as I mentioned that by increasing the encounter between people and then in the end that both North and South Korean uh, participants in, in this project would uh, realize that what would be uh, best for their societies and how they could uh, improve uh, their societies because no society is perfect. And, and then I think that at the moment, that from the perspective of South Korean NGOs, and then increasing the context would be quite important. But secondly, it does not necessarily mean that the uh, human rights advocacy uh, within South Korea about North Korea uh, is not important. It, it is important because again, the bring an awareness of the situation is important, but then, uh, I think that strategically, uh, that work uh, um, should be um, uh, coordinated, but then it should be independent from the work of the Korean peace building and humanitarian NGOs, because um, because we are constantly reminded of the fact that we are at a war. It's the, the Korean War is and is we are at an amnesty situation. But technically speaking, it's not ended. And then, you know, in these situations, it's not only tricky, but it could be um, misused or mispresented as a psychological warfare, for example. Like, so one could be very careful in terms of achieving one's goal and the, uh, in, in terms of the set goals and then the position is very important. But then to be able to have a better strategy, we need to understand the context uh, all the more. And in that sense, that uh, I think that we can work with the international community on the issue of uh, North Korean human rights. But in terms of the priority, in my personal opinion, between North and South Korea is that to build trust and to increase the context and then in, in people's interest. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Hendrik Johannemann. And he says, thank you very much for your insightful lecture. I would like to hear a little bit more about the role of religion. In the island conflict, the rift between Catholicism and Protestantism is deep. In Korea, this is quite different. In South Korea, conservative pro protestant groups cl claim that they are fighting for human rights in North Korea, while actually creating even more animosities between the North and the South, at least in my opinion. What do you think about the role of religion for peace on the Korean Peninsula? Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, that all very uh, thought-provoking questions. Thank you very much. And then. I shared a little bit of an exper uh, example of the South Korean church groups and then the North Korean, uh, excuse me, Christians uh, built relationships mediated by the World Council of Churches in the 80s. And then later they built their own relationship with each other. That was based on their understanding about the teaching of um, the uh, Bible, um, the, the sacred text. Uh, in Christianity, in saying that, you know, we are being asked to love our enemy. 
and then we don't get to love our neighbor and brothers and sisters and can we be called christian for example but it's not just about the christianity all the major religions in the world has this peace tradition in their own religion but at the same time sometimes war and conflict would be justified by their own religious tradition and there are other texts in their religious traditions and then religious texts which highlights uh, exclusive uh, dimension of one religion. So I would say the key here is that whether we would want to utilize the peace tradition uh, from the religions or we would want to just highlight uh, the, the war traditions from a particular religion. So it's a matter of interpretation. And sometimes it helps, for example, like uh, when you have this extreme position because of the religious identity, and when you get to look at the peace tradition of the uh, sacred text together, and then it would uh, sometimes change a people's position. And then it happened to those Korean Christians I mentioned before, because um, despite the different political affiliations in South Korea uh, from the perspective of Christianity, most of the Christians back in the day were uh, um, having this idea of anti-communism. And it's, it was understandable because of their experience about North Korea and the Korean War. But then when they were challenged about, uh, again, the, the, uh, the peace teaching were within their own religion, and then they got to ask the question, uh, what, again, would uh, it mean to have this identity of being in the particular religion? And then they would want to answer to that question. And then that's how it led to the first non-governmental meeting between North and South Korean uh, people back in the day. So I would say that, yes, it's challenging. And then, yes, it's different from the situation on the island of Ireland. But I think uh, still religion can make some positive impact on uh, peace building and on peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Um, we will continue the Q&A session uh, until 11.15, if that's okay for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your interest. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, from Dr. Sangu Kim, he says, well-known fact, the Clinton administration's involvement in the Northern Ireland peace process is the culmination of a long period of lobbying by Irish American groups. The leading role in influencing the US administration has been taken by a new grouping, Americans for a New Irish Agenda. Longer established organizations uh, with varying approaches have also had an impact on the evolution of American policy towards Northern Ireland. The Korean Immigration Society and the Irish Immigration Society in the United States are very different, but is there any way for overseas Koreans or NGOs, um, citizens, groups of overseas Koreans to use the government in their area to help peace on the Korean Peninsula? Um, thank you very much. I think that's very, again, the very critical and important question because, uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, not only the Irish case, but um, most, I mean, I, I would say them all, uh, the conflict, international conflict in the world is not just about the conflict within their own country or just with the country uh, of uh, the, uh, between the complicit parties but it is an international, uh, it has international dimensions and international connections. And I, like you mentioned that in terms of the role of the Irish uh, immigrant society uh, and diaspora in, in the United States was, uh, was a great uh, contribution uh, to the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement. And I will say that the role of the uh, immigrant overseas Koreans in the States is very much important and also uh, the overseas Koreans in Europe is also important because they can not only uh, make an impact on the as, as I said like in the case of the uh, interactions between the Japanese overseas Koreans 
and Chinese, overseas Koreans, and, and the North and South Koreans um, for peaceful interaction. But also they can make an influence on uh, their own government of their uh, residency, for example, like um, in terms of the EU policy on North Korea, EU policy on the Korean uh, peace process could be influenced by the actions and promotion by um, the, uh, the Korean Im immigrant society. And so that's why I think that this event is very, very important. And this inauguration of the, the research institute and the Korea uh, and EU and, and Germany, um, could, you know, they, they could discuss these issues together and then highlight the need for the support from the European Union, for example, and European civil society uh, about the need to build peace with North Korea and also on the Korean Peninsula. And then equally, for example, like uh, the overseas Koreans in the States and particularly in Washington, uh, they can also promote the need for ending the war, for example. And I know that there is a campaign going on and lots of overseas Koreans are part of it. Uh, and then it would be very, very, very helpful. And particularly in the transition time in the United States. And then um, I know that there are some um, movements uh, to talk about these issues. And, and then because... Um, that there would be uh, some time uh, needed for the new Biden administration, for example, in the States, uh, to uh, set up their own North Korea policy. And in between all those times, and, and then there would be a lot of confusions and controversy and complexity would go on. But then again, that I think that the position of the overseas Koreans and then, it, and then their cooperation with the American civil society would be very, very important in this state. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one last question, uh, which is from Kim Po Hyun. Um, thank you for your insightful presentation, Dr. Kim. You mentioned during your lecture that the actions and challenges from the governmental side are not always coherent with the NGO and civil groups peace building work. In relation to that, what kind of lobby, acti uh, lobby activities um, do the civil groups in South Korea take to work with Korean government? For example, any lobby strategies to amend the South Korean security laws? Thank you. Thank you very much for that excellent question. And then the issue has been uh, always there. I would say that um, even back in the day since 70s and 80s and 90s. And then because of the, the regulation, because of the situation uh, on the Korean Peninsula, the, the um, activity of civil society is quite limited. There has been uh, serious attempts and, uh, and initiatives uh, to not only lobby, but work with, uh, to, to, to be able to work with the government itself. Um, and then um, oftentimes and uh, change the institution and sometimes to maintain the institution and uh, institutionalize uh, the Korean uh, peace process, for example, um, to protect the civil the civilian activities uh, um, uh, between uh, North and South Korea. And as you know, that we do have national security law mentioned, but we do also have the law called uh, inter-Korean cooperation and exchange law. And then from there, then we do have inter-Korean cooperation fund act. And then all of that are, are, were being considered to be revised and then to be strengthened, for example. And yes, that there is a conflict between the inter-Korean uh, cooperation and exchange law and the national security law, but then, as you know, that even if, again, that we uh, change the law or we remove the law and we change the situation, but then at the end of the day, um, even if, uh, you know, we get to say that the government uh, changes in South Korea, not necessarily because of their North Korea policy, but because of the South Korean uh, so-called South-South conflict or economic issues influencing the change of the government and, and in you know, leading the North Korea policy change from the perspective of the South Korean government. 
But at the same time that I would say that civil society itself also needs to work on uh, themselves, if I may say that as part of, uh, even though I live in Ireland and uh, as part of the Korean uh, wider civil society, that I think that we would also have to work on our internal issues as well to be able to work with the government um, because then how could we facilitate uh, the dialogue between the different uh, politically affiliated groups? How could we promote uh, the common interest in, term, in terms of sharing the dream of peace process uh, in a divided society, uh, politically, for example, conservative and liberals and progressive? How could we come up with uh, 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 some sort of unified and, and shared interest to be able to work with uh, the, the government would also be uh, an important uh, um, element because, uh, again, that you know, law can change and it can be reenacted and revised. But at the end of the day, in a democratic society, the will of people is important. And and as John Paul Leder mentioned, that how many people could how I mean, on the critical mass in the society to be able to monitor what the government would do would be very very important. So I was thinking think that we would need uh, uh, this, this to the this end, both approach, like work with the government and lobby the government, but at the same time, work within the society to achieve uh, the shared dream together. Uh, thank you very much for your answer again. Now, one final question for Ria, I promise. Um, <laughs> The question is from Che Hyun Dok, and he asks, the Moon Jae-in government in South Korea has made much effort to improve the relationship with North Korea, including solving the nuclear problem and fundamental question of ending the Korean War. However, the South Korean civil society, which were involved in humanitarian and uh, solidarity movement with North Korea, is still far from rebeginning their activities. What would be the reason why the activities of South Korean civil society uh, still are frozen even under the government who has been trying so hard in order to promote the peace process? Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, uh, it's, it's very important, but it's also a very difficult question because it's, it's very complex. And as many of you know, that at one level that we can approach this question from the different levels that we have international level uh, because we have international sanctions and then sanctions uh, were toughened as many of you know um, particularly uh, since 2016 and now it's very very compressed comprehensive the sanction uh, since the uh, the uh, iraq uh, Iraqi sanctions and the international community came up with this idea of targeted and smart sanction uh, and, and to be able to reduce the fatality of the humanitarian cost. But then it um, has been increasingly comprehensive, not only on North Korea, but in many uh, different regions, the sanctions uh, have been um, sort of prohibiting the work of many humanitarian NGOs in many different conflict-affected uh, uh, areas. And secondly, there is a domestic issues. Um, in terms of the, the concept of peace building, that you would want to build bridges between the ordinary people, but that there are reasons why uh, we have this wall between, uh, between the conflict parties. And as in the name of most of the time, the peacekeeping missions, and you have this buffer zone in Korea, we call it the militarized zone. And it was there because there was a war. And then the war, the, the, the zone is still there um, in the name of national security. It's not just from South Korea, uh, also from North Korea, even though we've uh, implemented some measures on DMZ as part of the agreements the, under the recent government, you know, the Moon Jae-in government, which is a very, very um, uh, uh, promising um, sort of uh, progress. But unfortunately, it's there because uh, both parties would still feel that there is uh, some issue of national security, and then they, there is no resolution about that. And of course, uh, there is an international element, it, like because 
we couldn't end the war. That means that, you know, as long as uh, those situation continues, there will be some sort of restrictions despite, you know, the efforts from the government and the civil society actions. And, and finally, that again, that there is an issue within the society as well, because again, that there are um, people who would uh, love to uh, work on um, the peace building activities uh, uh, with North Korea, or at least support the peace process with North Korea. But uh, again, that because of the mistrust, and then I mean, it's understandable because we are living uh, in a conflict affected society. So it takes time. What I want to say is that there would, we would need uh, an international diplomacy, and we would need a political solution, and we would need a societal solutions. And then we need to, I think, work together. But the key thing here is that, you know, um, yes, we saw some great improvement under the Kim Dae-jung administration with the sunshine policy. And then we were very hopeful because the Moon Jae-in administration's uh, great push uh, for peace, uh, you know, process. But then it's, it doesn't just happen because uh, the uh, government changes. I think that it, it requires constant effort uh, from the civil society and from the people to sustain this initiative, to sustain this process. So thank you. Dr. Kim Dong Jin, thank you very much for your extra time that you gave us and the audience. I think they are all very thankful. I apologize to, the, um, to those which uh, question I couldn't um, Forward to Dr. Kim. Now the time is up. Thank you again. And after a 30 minutes break, um, we have our next lecturer, Dr. Erik J. Balbach, and he will talk about the role of the EU in Korean Peninsula security affairs. I hope to see you there as well.